Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Merry Christmas! Merry Christmas! Merry Christmas. Do you feel like Christmas is over? No, not really. Christmas has come. Christmas Day is gone. The snow has come. The snow is gone, at least we hope. I missed y'all. I missed y'all last week. I'm so glad to be back. I, I, the Christmas celebration is such a fun time of year. And did you have a good time with your families and all your friends? Yeah. I mean, Christmas Eve is a special time at our house. And if your house, either on Christmas Eve or Christmas Day, was anything like our house, by the time all the presents are open and the little kids are running around, the living room is trashed. There's paper and boxes and pieces, you know, little twist ties to hold everything together are scattered all over. We're still fine. And when everything is done, then comes the parts, the part that dads don't like. It's time to put all the toys together. Right? And guys, did we use the instruction manual? No. no. What do we do? We look at the picture on the box. How to be simple enough? Ladies, you know it already. I'll tell you this. If the dad has to go get the instruction manual out, he's way past the point of frustrating. <laughs> All right? Christmas is a joyful time of year. It's a celebration. But what I want you to understand this morning is that Christmas and what it means gives us a joy that is for every day of our life, not just the Christmas day or the Christmas season in the church, but it is something that is to fill our hearts with joy and excitement every day of our lives. And that's not to take away from, from Good Friday and Easter. The events of Holy Week and of Jesus on the cross on Good Friday and Easter Sunday accomplished our salvation. And we celebrate those. But Christmas is the day that God gave to us the greatest gift He could give. And like Sarah said in the children's lesson, it's the gift that doesn't get old, that doesn't get scratched up, that never gets worn out and never breaks. He gave us the gift of His Son. And that's a gift that lasts, and a gift that changes the reality of who we are. And I think we do a disservice to God and to the message of the gospel when we only speak of Christmas during the Christmas season. The Apostle Paul, when he talked about the sower and the seed in, in, in uh, 2 Corinthians 9, says, the one who sows sparingly will reap sparingly. The one who sows abundantly will reap abundantly. In other words, if you put the greatest in, what do you expect back? The greatest. And God put the greatest he had to give. In fact, at the end of that chapter, Paul goes on to say, thanks be to God for his unspeakable gift. God put the greatest he had to give. In. He, he gave the greatest he could possibly give. And what you need to understand is that he made that commitment to give to us his son even before time began. He made the choice to give his best so he could reap back a great reward. And what's that? Is you know. Because you're going to find out in this message what gives God joy is blessing you. That's what's in his heart to do. So like I said, I think we fall short when we make Christmas about a season and Easter about the rest of the year. They both go together, all of you. And yet so many people don't understand it. They don't understand what God did and why he did it. There's a missionary named Don Richardson. Some of you have probably read his book, and so this won't be any surprise to you. I won't pronounce the name of the tribe right. In the early 60s, Don and his wife Carol went to Papua New Guinea to try to minister to the Savoy tribe. The Savoy tribe were native to Papua New Guinea. They were cannibals, even to the 1950s. They were still cannibals. They would sleep on the skulls of their slain enemies as their pillows. They were a warring tribe, and they were always at war with someone. Well, Don and his wife Carol went into this tribe as missionaries. They had learned the languages of Papua New Guinea before they got there, so he kind of hit the ground running. He was going to minister to them of the gospel. And so when he finally convinced them he wasn't there to do them harm and began to minister to them, he started by reading the gospel of Matthew. And they listened. 
the stories of Jesus' birth and calling his disciples. And when they got to the events of Holy Week and they got to Judas betraying Jesus, they erupted in applause and celebration and they danced and they hooped and they hollered. They were excited about Judas because in their culture, the one who's the most devious, the one who is filled with treachery, this is the one you honor. He's the one to be most respected. And so they celebrated Judas and what he did to Jesus and missed the story of Jesus altogether. And he didn't know what to do. God and his wife Carol did not know how to get through to this warring tribe of cannibals what it means that God gave the gift of his son. Until the day came that this tribe and other tribes had warred so much that they finally were ready for peace. And in their culture, and God writes about it in his book, he witnessed how they brought about peace. Because in their culture, the only way the two warring tribes stopped fighting is if the chief of one tribe gave his son to the chief of the other tribe as a peace offering. It was known as the peace child. And with the exchange of the peace child, hostilities between the two would stop. And that was the way by which Don Richardson preached the gospel to the Savoy tribe of Papua New Guinea. That God gave a peace child, his only son, into the hands of his enemies, a hostile world, so that hostilities could stop and there could be peace. That's what God did. Today, the Savoy tribe of Papua New Guinea is overwhelmingly Christian. Because the message of Christmas changes not one day of the year, but it changes everything about our lives. They are Christian today because they understood that God gave the gift of a child to establish peace. And it is that gift that changes everything that we are. The Apostle, or not the Apostle, King Solomon wrote, God has put eternity into their hearts. Everyone in this world is searching for God in some way, shape, or form. It's there, deep inside the very core of who we are. We're searching, we're, we're yearning for some understanding that God is out there. And did you hear what, what Ann read? That God has put eternity into their hearts. We know that there's a God, but then he goes on to say, and what God did was good, and nothing can be added to it, and nothing can be taken away from it. It's perfect just the way it is. Apply that to Christmas. Apply that to the events of Jesus' birth. Jesus was not born in a palace surrounded by dignitaries and, and royalty. He was born in a stable, surrounded by animals, without a nursemaid or anyone there trained to help. The angels did not appear to the religious leaders, the political leaders. They appeared to shepherds, the loneliest of society, out in the fields. Why is that? Because maybe Jesus didn't come for just the special people. Maybe he came for the everyday people, the common people, just like you and me. And why did God do it that way? Because it's just how he wanted it to be. It was perfect. You can't add to it, and you can't take away from it, according to Solomon. It's just the way God wanted it to be. It was perfect in his eyes, and it was for us. So we can understand that God was giving us a peace child. So that hostilities between us and God could end. And we could find the love that God wants us to have. But therein lies the problem. So many people won't accept it. A world full of people, full of people that know that there's something more than them. God's put it in their hearts, but they don't know where to go for it. And they certainly don't want Jesus. And why is that? Well, one reason is because people want to add to it. That's our fault. And understand, I'm picking on us, the church. You gotta walk a certain way, talk a certain way, dress a certain way, act a certain way. You gotta meet a certain standard in order to be acceptable in the church. I thought Jesus came for everyday people, common and lowly like the rest of us. All of a sudden we have this high standard that people have to meet to be accepted or to be part. And people don't want any part of that. What did God say? You can't add anything to it. You can't take anything away from it. It's perfect just the way it is. We need to learn that lesson. We, God's people, need to learn that lesson. 
to stop adding to what God has done and simply let God be God and be the one that accepts everybody. Another reason people don't come to Jesus, don't celebrate what Christmas means in their lives is because they're scared. A lot of people are scared of God for a lot of different reasons. Sometimes they're scared of God because they think God will follow through with His promises. That somehow He'll offer the, you know, sky's the limit and give them nothing. They haven't experienced the faithfulness of God in their lives or faithfulness of anyone else. And they're scared to take a chance so they don't come. Sometimes, sarcastically, people think if they come to God, it'll take away all the fun in their life. As if the things they're doing in their lives are really fun. But they don't understand what it means to have meaning and purpose and value to their lives if they run and hide. There's some people who are scared to come to God because they don't feel worthy. They look at their life and their past and the mistakes they've made and they feel so absolutely unworthy of love that when God offers the free gift, it's more than they can understand. So instead of turning to God, they turn away. Because who would give them anything free? And yes, there's some people who are angry at God. They're mad at God. Because the things that have happened in their life, they think they've been mistreated or it's unfair. They turn away from God. They're angry. They shake their fist at heaven. But what does God want for them? He wants to love them. That's why He sent Jesus. He wants to take the fear and the disappointments and the failures and the hurts and the heartaches, and he wants to replace them with the joy of knowing that God has given you the gift, the greatest gift the world has ever known, the gift of Jesus. And he can make a difference in a person's life who's hurting. If we, God's people, can communicate truthfully, without adding to it, without taking away, truthfully who God is and what he's done. How many of you ever heard the story of the Christmas Scout? Anybody ever heard the Christmas Scout story? we got a bunch of scouts that are always in church. I found this illustration. It's a story. I think it's true. About Frank Wilson. Frank Wilson was 13 years old. It was Christmas Eve, and Frank Wilson had spent the evening with his family, grandma and grandpa and aunts and uncles. Everybody had come to, to, to his house on Christmas Eve this year. He got more gifts than he ever got in his life on any Christmas. And everyone was just doting on him. But Frank Wilson was not happy. He was hurting. You see, it was his first Christmas without his older brother, Steve. Steve died in a car wreck. And it was his first Christmas without his older brother, and he missed him. He had gotten so many gifts, he didn't know what to do with them all. But he, but he was hurting on the inside. And all the family was laughing and talking, trying to make it good for Frank. But that's what happened. They kind of overdid it. And he just wanted to get away. So he asked his mom and dad if he could go over to some patrol leader's house. And they agreed. He said goodbye to Grandma and Grandpa and everybody. He took all of his gifts and put them on his new sled and put on a plaid coat that he'd gotten from Grandma. It was his favorite gift, and he headed out in the snow. He wanted to go see his patrol leader because while his patrol leader wasn't rich by any standard, he was rich in wisdom. They always felt he could relate to him. So the only problem was the patrol leader lived in the flats, the poor side of town. So Frank drugged the sled, loaded down with all his toys because he wanted to show him what he got for Christmas, through the streets and down the hills until he made it into the flats, and he was absolutely disappointed that his patrol leader was on him. He stood there at his house for a while and decided to go back home. Turned the sled around as he's trudging through the snow, he's looking in the windows of the houses that he quickly bypassed his way. And as he made it, up the street, looking at the house, he saw Christmas trees and families around with fireplaces going, but they were small houses. People weren't rich at all. And then he stopped outside one house, out in the middle of the street, and looked in. And there through the window he saw a fireplace with stockings hung, just like he and Steve used to hang in their fireplace. And they would get up on Christmas morning and be bursting full of presents. But these stockings were empty. 
and there was a young mother sitting inside by herself crying. Frank started to go on, but then he thought, I haven't done my good deed for the day. And before the impulse passed, he turned and went up to the door and knocked on the door of the house. The young mother came and opened the door, and seeing the sled full of presents, thought he was collecting them. And she said, I'm sorry, young man, I don't have anything I can give you. I don't even have any toys or food for my children. And he said, no, ma'am, that's not why I'm here. I want you to take toys for your children, anything you want, to fill their stockings. The woman was excited. She took some candy and a puzzle and a toy airplane. And when she took his new scout flashlight, he started to object, but thought better of it. And soon the stockings were full. As he turned to drag his sled onward, the lady said, well, can't you tell me your name? He said, no, ma'am, it doesn't matter. Just call me the Christmas Scout. And he went on down the street. And before he had left the flats, he'd given away every one of his presents. His plaid jacket that he was so proud of went to a little boy who had no coat. The sled was placed up next to the side of a house by the front door of a boy who was crippled. All the rest of the toys were gone. And he made his way home. As he got near his street, near his house, he began to wonder to himself, what am I going to tell mom and dad? I gave everything away. But you know, inside he felt good. Inside there was joy in his heart, flickering and, and beginning to burn that he hadn't had in a long time since Steve died. He felt so good. When he walked in the door, the first thing his mom says, where's your new coat? Well, I gave it away. You what? Where are all your toys? I give them all away. What are we going to tell your grandmother? What are we going to tell your aunts and uncles? They spent all that time, spent all that money shopping for you, and you didn't appreciate what they gave. Dad chimed in. Well, you've done it now. We don't have any money for more toys. You're not getting anything else. All of a sudden, the joy left. He made his way upstairs, knowing his family was disappointed in him, hurting on the inside, crawled into bed and thought of his brother Steve who cried himself to sleep. He didn't want the toys back. He knew as a scout that a good deed is as merits in and of itself. It's not to be rewarded. He didn't want the toys back, but he didn't think it would be like that. His heart was hurting. He woke up the next morning to the sound of mom in the kitchen and dad talking and Christmas carols playing on the radio. He went downstairs and didn't say anything. The Christmas carol ended and the announcer came on the radio. Merry Christmas! The greatest Christmas story we have this morning comes from the flats. There are children down there who are excited and happy. A young boy has a new coat. The little cripple boy has a sled, his stockings are overflowing, all because of a young teenager who donated all kinds of toys. No one knows his name, but the children down there say that he is the personal representative of old St. Nick himself. He simply went by the Christmas Scout. Merry Christmas to everyone. And the Christmas carols came back on. Frank felt his father's hand on his shoulder. He looked over and his mother was crying through her tears, smiling through her tears. She said, we didn't understand. We didn't know. We're proud of you for what you did. And all of a sudden, Frank Wilson's heart felt that little flicker of joy again. That he had done something good for someone else. Do you understand? That it's not about you. It's not about who you are or where you come from or what you've done or mistakes you've made. It's not about you at all. It's about God. He loves to bless you. And his heart was filled with joy when he sent Jesus into this world to be your Savior. He gave because of the joy he felt in his heart in giving. And because of his giving, your life has changed. He has blessed you with a 
Savior. The greatest gift. As Paul said, thanks be to God for his unspeakable gift. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Happy Easter.